Welcome to Climate Change and Health in Small Island Developing States. Focus on the Caribbean. If you require translation into Spanish or French, please use the link posted in the chat and choose your desired language at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You should continue to keep this browser open as well to utilize the chat and Q&A features. Please be sure to scroll down and mute the video. Please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions for the panelists. The session is being recorded. Thank you. Go ahead, Cal. OK, thank you. Hello and welcome to you all to this uh, special panel presentation on strengthening research capacity in climate change and health. It's part of the Yale conference event on climate change and health, uh, focusing on the small island developing states and with a particular focus on the Caribbean region. My name is Cal McPherson. I am Professor and Dean of Graduate Studies and Director of Research here at St. George's University in Grenada. And it is my pleasure to introduce our five distinguished panelists this afternoon. And I'm going to introduce them all. And after their presentation, they will continue with the next uh, panelist. We have heard during this week that uh, no individual, no animal, no plant, no ecosystem, no country has been untouched by climate change, providing an incredible need for applied research. And today we're going to focus on strengthening our research capacity to tackle the problems of climate change and health. And the panelists today are Dr. Lindona Glasgow, who is the Deputy Chair and Assistant Professor in our Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine here at St. George's University, and a Research Fellow with Windref. Lindona will be followed by Dr. Francis Maguire, who is the Climate policy manager of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Action. Dr. Maguire has over 30 years of experience in international organizations, NGOs, the National Health Service, and in academia on research and education in climate change. And she will co-share her time with Dr. Ro Ro Roani uh, Ng Shi from the, who is the Pacific Health Research Program Manager at the School of Population Health in the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So good morning, Roani, uh, and welcome. And after Rowani will be Professor Marvin Reed, who is the president of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians and the deputy dean of research and graduate studies at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. And last 
but certainly not least is Dr. Maureen Litchfield, who is the Dean of the Graduate School of Public Health, the, a professor of environmental and occupational health, and the Jonas Salk Chair of Population Health at the University of Pittsburgh in the United States. So thank you to all the panelists for agreeing to present here today. Thank you to the audience who have joined us. I know we're going to have a really interesting afternoon. And so without further ado, I invite Dr. Lindonna Glasgow to make the first presentation. Thank you, Dr. McPherson. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So in this uh, first session, I am going to present on building climate change and health research capacity in Caribbean institutions. And it is worth noting as we begin the presence of many academic institutions in our region. And this is indicative of the potential capacity for climate change research and implementation within our region. Now the Superior Council of Scientific Investigations, which is a public research body, um, reported that there are about 239 universities and colleges operating in Caribbean countries. So as I said, this indicates the capacity that resides in our region. In the effort to build climate change research capacity, the UNFCCC points out the need to focus on both the individual and institutional levels. And these levels function within the broader enabling or systematic environment. Now in the Caribbean context, there is need to ramp up research in critical areas, ranging from greenhouse gas emission accounting to modeling projections about future events, vulnerability and impacts on health and well-being. Caribbean academic institutions can also play other critical roles and make our contributions to climate change and health research that are context appropriate, considering the region's small island states, heightened vulnerability, and the limited uh, resources that reside in our areas. Now, academics can play an important role in building confidence in research and facilitating government and communities uh, participation. The next few minutes, I want to spend zeroing in on the uh, capacity building um, approaches that our universities can uh, pursue. So firstly, we need to create institution-based climate change research policy. And those policies should be hinged on the regional and international agenda. And as we do so, we should create the mandates across all levels of learners, not just the students, but also faculty and administration. This is important to facilitate the, um, the research agenda within our institutions. We also need to invest in research centers of excellence dedicated to climate change work, where experts can also practice and can undertake work within those facilities. Now, those experts can function as adjunct or full-time uh, professors and can help with the managing of grants, sourcing and managing of grants, personnel, coordination of outcomes, et cetera. We also need to cultivate the research culture and talent in the institutions through coaching, mentoring, and handholding. And this is important to support 
uh, both those that are experienced as well as new incoming students and faculty into the arena of climate change research. Institutionalizing the structures for cluster grant sourcing is also important. And this will support in particular young researchers and students as they build expertise and as we leverage expertise across departments. We should also make climate change research laterally and vertically transitional across courses and programs. So when students move from the undergrad level to the grad level, climate change should be a continuing theme for them. They continue to build skills and expertise in those areas. And so the provision should be made for that. We need to look, look back results to research starting point. It should not be an, there should not be an end when results are produced, but instead to build capacity, we should give others the opportunity to begin at that point and to build on the research that was already done. Formalizing partnerships is very important. And we do have some key institutions functioning, operating in the region, such as PAHO, WHO, UNFCCC, UNEP, et cetera. And we can draw on their expertise. Hard and soft capacity for science-oriented research is also important. Building laboratory capacity, we need to incorporate climate change research and promotion criteria, cater for succession planning, that is also very important. And finally, we need to build climate change focus into curricula across disciplines. So those are some of the major um, undertakings that can be pursued by Caribbean institutions to build capacity for climate change and health research. Thank you very much. Shall I just get started? We... Sorry, I, um, I didn't realize I was on mute. So thank you, Dr. Glasgow. And uh, we're now moving to Dr. Francis McGuire and Dr. Uh, po Shi um, Ng Shi, who has a lot of research and education experience in the small island developing states of the Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, this evening. I'm in the UK, so it is evening for me. And um, I'll hand over to Rowani in a bit, who is based in Auckland in New Zealand. So it's morning for Rowani. So we're doing the good afternoon, good evening, good morning thing. Um, last week, this happened for me. I got the positive lateral flow test result that none of us want to get. And unfortunately, it converted into uh, me realizing I do have COVID. So forgive the croaky voice. Um, I'm literally got one more day of isolation to go, but I really wanted to join uh, tonight and, and present. Um, I want to share just a few thoughts about research priorities. Uh, I'm the policy manager at, Lance, at the Lancet Countdown. If you haven't come across this, I'm hoping that everyone listening has. Um, but the, the Lancet Countdown is a global research endeavor, um, which, oh, next slide, please. Um, which takes a, uh, uh, which tracks a series of, of climate and health indicators. We, we started work uh, five years ago, um, just around the Paris Agreement, and we've produced five reports. Um, our, our next one is due in two weeks, so please do register um, at our launch event, which will be two weeks today. Uh, go online, uh, Twitter, you can find the, the, the links already. Um, no spoilers today, obviously, um, but uh, this will build on the work that we've done in the previous five years. We produce these five reports that look at indicators and, and, and as well, we release a series of um, policy briefings that we, we develop with um, a range of health bodies. Um, so just really briefly, um, the Lancet Countdown is working with the University of the West Indies to develop research capacity in the Caribbean. And I'm working very closely with 
Georgiana Gordon Strachan uh, on that, and that will be one of my priorities for next year. But not being based in the Caribbean, I, I don't want to talk about the priorities for the region. Um, I want to leave that to others, but I do also want to connect across to Oani in a minute to talk about priorities for, for SIDS, or at least a case study for SIDS uh, in the Pacific region. But I just want to reflect very briefly on 30 years of working on climate change. Having lived and worked through the remarkable efforts of the IPCC and the policy process of the UNFCCC, the growth in public support that's been brought through the youth um, climate movement in, in the last couple of years. And, and, and to say that, um, you know, that's a remarkable process really in 30 years. I mean, it may seem sometimes like we're, we're moving glacially slowly, but in 30 years, the science is in, uh, we know what policies we need. The political, uh, the public support is there for action now. And even actually, there's quite a lot of political support. And we've now got to convert that from uh, all, that, all of that really into um, action that, that delivers greenhouse gas emission reductions directly. Uh, but we've got to do this really quickly now. We have less than 10 years to change tack. Um, so it's time to do things a little bit differently perhaps. So next slide, please. And I'm not gonna go into detail at all. I'm just gonna credit, first of all, Liana Stupples, uh, a mentor of mine uh, based in New Zealand for the, the picture. Uh, the sky and the ocean um, really drew me while I'd been in isolation for the last 10 days, feeling quite rough. Uh, and to say that I think we need to be working more at the interface between science and policy and to work out how to truly translate science and, and use it to develop policy and practice. Drawing on the theory of change, we've been working through a theory of change at the Lancet Countdown, so we'll be working through that next year. But I think we need to look at the science literacy of policymakers. That's been really clear in the COVID pandemic. But we also need to develop the policy literacy of science researchers. There's some really big gaps there, and I'm, I'm very keen to start working in that field. Horizon scanning, using uh, the image perhaps. And I think key skills for 21st century researchers will be agility, uh, moving quickly. We've got to change tack in the next decade. Diplomacy, influencing, cooperation, and collaboration. And on that note, I'll hand over to Rani. Uh, next slide, please. So, Talofalava, Malo, Lava Lesoi for Manawia. Good morning and warm Pacific greetings, everyone from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you, Francis. So, our scoping project is just getting started, um, and I'm going to cover our approach, key issues, and our project plan. Resilience means different things to different people, but there must at least be a common understanding for resilience in order to have effective delivery of targeted interventions. The Pacific region is experiencing twin crises with climate change and NCDs. As such, resilience is a growing area of concern given the numerous environmental, health, social and economic threats that the region is experiencing. This has led to a surge of projects, both research and non-research focus on Pacific youth resilience across the region. These projects are diverse in scope and scale, ranging from studies on core issues like climate change, understanding youth resilience at a national level to advocacy projects that aim to provide a platform for the inclusion of Pacific youth in decision-making and policy. Subsequently, there is also a wide range of approaches and methods used in these projects, with some projects having no engagement at all, while others use participatory action research. Given the breadth of studies, projects, and related approaches, I reveal these projects as vital for future studies so we firstly have an overall sense of knowledge, evidence, and the intelligence from the region of what best practice for Pacific youth engagement looks like. But secondly, to avoid the dreaded duplication. Half of the Pacific region are under 23 years old. Therefore, a resilient and empowered Pacific youth population is critical for the economic prosperity, political success, and social stability of the, of the Pacific. So to do this, we need to ensure that Pacific youth are engaged in both research and designing evidence-based policy. And by this, I don't mean just consultations after the research has been completed or once policy makers have finished crafting policy documents and reports. An equal partnership with Pacific youth is important given their critiques and legitimate concerns in response to the, to the proliferation of youth projects in the region, but also to ensure transformative action where the research and policy outcomes are effective and sustainable. So Pacific Youth representatives and advocates from several youth NGOs like Raising Pacific Voices and Pacific350.org have raised concerns such as tokenism, access to resources and the lack of interest. 
Our approach is to engage with key voices and understanding what resilience means and looks like from their perspective and what is best practice when engaging and delivering Pacific youth focused interventions. Our study is framed and underpinned by the Pacific Communities Pacific Youth Development Framework, which was developed in collaboration with youth stakeholders and others. The framework provides us a useful tool to assist in engaging Pacific youth and leading change towards the framework's vision of a sustainable Pacific, where all young people are safe, respected, empowered and resilient. So in the same way that youth have contributed to the understanding of Pacific youth development, there must be a common understanding of resilience for young people. Pacific youth have been active over the last decade in reframing the climate change narrative from viewing Pacific people simply as climate change victims to viewing them as a sea of warriors, acknowledging Pacific people and specifically young people's agency and ability to work together. Next slide, please. Um, so this is our project plan. As you can see, the key questions for the project are what does resilience mean to Pacific youth? What evidence, research and projects are from and with the Pacific? And how do we best engage youth in research and evidence-based policy? So we've just begun our comprehensive review of academic and grey literatures to identify and map current and relevant sources of data and intelligence for building resilience in the Pacific. Um, for this initial scoping review, we are only focusing on Samoa, the Cook Islands, Niue, Tonga and New Zealand. Using Talanoa research methods, the results and findings from the literature review will be discussed with groups of between six to eight young people in each of the five countries. Talanoa research method is a widely accepted Pacific research process that facilitates open and formal conversations between people in which they can share their stories, thoughts and feelings. The ages of youth will be between 14 to 24 years old in line with the definition of Pacific youth and focus groups will be facilitated by Pacific350.org in the Pacific region and with Pacific youth leaders in Auckland, New Zealand. The key questions for the focus group will include, do they agree with the definitions of resilience for youth identified in the literature? What else is missing from the literature? And do they agree with the best practice models identified in the literature? Lastly, and I guess most importantly for us, is from their experience, are there any other models of engagement that work best for the Pacific youth? Our New Zealand focus groups will be delivered with GNA Science, New Zealand's leading provider of earth geoscience and isotope research. Given the recent floods in Auckland in September during this current outbreak and lockdown, this presents a unique opportunity to further explore community resilience. Pacific youth have been the hands and feet of the Pacific community. And during this latest outbreak, this has been made absolutely clear where they've been disproportionately affected in terms of COVID exposures and educational and social outcomes. So the results from this study will help to address current knowledge gaps in terms of resilience in the Pacific, but the study methods will also help to shed some light on a common understanding of resilience by and for Pacific youth in the same way that Pacific youth have been able to define what Pacific youth development means to them. There is also no single reference point to give guidance on how to best engage Pacific youth and resiliency projects, and this project will allow Pacific young people to evaluate past research methods and approaches to assist future research projects that target Pacific young people. The study will address these important knowledge gaps and will then help to frame and inform a scaled up research project focusing on building youth resilience across the Pacific region to include both the North Pacific and the West Pacific. Thank you for the, your time and over to you, Cal. Thank you, Ruana, and thank you, Francis. Uh, thank you for powering your way through uh, COVID and for sharing uh, those uh, presentations with us here this afternoon. And uh, we now will hear from Professor Marvin Reed uh, from Jamaica. Right, um, colleagues, uh, just making sure that the share screen works well, which it does. So 
the, the good news is that uh, most of what I have to say has been said already by um, my previous speakers. And what I'm going to be talking about really to set the framework for um, our discussion later on is really um, just to remind ourselves about the continuum that describes what we call uh, research from the lab um, to policy. And so that continuum has been given all sorts of fancy names these days, but most people will tend to call it translational research and translational activities. And the group at Harvard has actually created a nice infographics, which, which I like to use, which essentially says that once it is that we're thinking about a research question, the, in terms of the continuum, we have the basic science component all the way up to when that research becomes tested in human populations and become translated into policy. So when we think about the research enterprise, um, how I like to view it is really a three-legged stool, which says that you have structures, enablers, and an output. So clearly, when we talk about the structures, we're talking about whatever training programs we have, samples that we may have, physical resources, the financial resources, the administrative support, and the researchers, which are an important component of that structure. And in order for them to function, you have to have an enabling environment. And enabling environment will include research funds, partnerships and network, what the regulator environment is, and clearly um, an important issue as well, that of mentorship. And once you have the enablers, the structures, then you'll have some degree of outputs, which may involve policy changes, systemic changes, the creation of new knowledge, how that new knowledge is disseminated, and the further generation of new questions. So I'm here in my capacity as a family physician, general practitioner, if you're more on the UK side. Um, and we interact with health system within the Caribbean. Most of the, especially the English speaking Caribbean, focuses on what we call a primary care model, where a lot of the care is tried, is delivered at the community level. And many of the governments in the region have signed up and have instituted policy, which is aimed at and generating universal health coverage, which by definition means that individuals should have access to the health services they need when and where they need them without too much of a financial hardship. So if we accept that, we recognize therefore that certainly any health intervention that may um, be thought of or individuals may want to implement has to go through this stepwise process um, before we can actually assess what its impact is. So clearly there has to be um, accessibility. And more importantly, from a provider standpoint, which is where I sit, we, you ha we have to have provider, patient, and community compliance and adherence. And then and only then would you be able to get any form of impact. So therefore, the primary care physician as a community represent an important stakeholder through which any research or any research capacity or any research that is going to be performed in um, climate change um, would need to, to be involved in. So certainly as primary care physicians, we, we will have other partners, whether those be NGOs, whether those be universities or any other sort of organizations. Because one of the things that we have, or one of the advantages that we have is that our clients or communities trust us um, in terms of communication, trust us in terms of um, the care that they receive. And therefore we represent a, a very influential partner. Um, the other part of our role has to do with our advocacy level that we participate with at our policymakers level. So therefore, a, a lot of the health related sets of activities um, for which, uh, which occurs within the Caribbean are heavily, heavily influenced by the work, role and advocacy that primary care physicians um, do. So, with that, I will close um, and uh, I'll take my questions later in the panel. 
Thank you very much, Marvin, for that presentation and for sharing your uh, vision there. And uh, we now move to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Maureen Litchfield from the University of Pittsburgh in the USA. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. And so you'll see uh, remarkable similarities um, across the presentations. And so um, we're running a bit behind. So I'm making sure that um, we we uh, we get it all. Here we go. So um, this afternoon, I really my job as the anchoring speaker is to bring it all together. Um, and describe how science policy and practice interrelate, um, present priorities um, for climate and health action in the Caribbean. That's how we started this conference. And then to discuss science policy and practice gaps through one lens, and that's the lens of um, air pollution. And so if you think about science policy and practice in a triangle like that, then our focus on action and our focus on gaps is along the, the green bio-directional uh, arrows and the buckets that are in white. And so you've already heard from the previous speakers that the translation of science into policy is key. And with that translation comes implementation science. But we also know, and very often that's lacking, is where policy, the application of policy itself can identify gaps in science and gaps in research. On the other side, um, science uh, is meant to either prevent, interfere, lead to risk reduction. But at the same time, and there was a question about citizen science, the practice frontline is key to identify gaps in the research so that we can focus our research agenda. And then um, lastly on the bottom, um, while practice implementation um, is, is fueled and informed by policy, the lack of monitoring, particularly in the Caribbean, um, is influencing ineffective policy. And so what are the priorities? You'll see a remarkable, again, um, congruence between the Pan American Health Organization four strategic lines um, for action and the six strategic imperatives that Dr. Hospitalis and I and uh, ministry, directors of health in all of the Caribbean countries come together to develop. And I will focus on those six. You see that we start with raising awareness, um, strengthening resilience, but data, as you can see, is in both um, sets of priorities, as is the issue of regional sustainability, and you've heard regional action mentioned in the previous panels. Um, the built environment and, and health facilities, you've, you've seen in both of those um, sets of priorities, but particularly, the need for leadership. And so if we take one of those um, strategic imperatives, in this case, the first one of raising awareness, you've heard from colleagues about the importance of increasing um, the, the knowledge and the skills in our health professions workforce. So one measurable objective, data makes science work uh, and data drives action is are a number of countries that, um, for example, have a communication and educational programs um, leading directly to one approach, there are many approaches, of developing a climate change and health workforce. And that is precisely what EarthMedic is about, one of the uh, co-sponsors of this conference. Um, similarly, if you look at multi-sectoral data, um, developing a network of networks, and you've heard earlier on in a session on how to advance tourism and health. And so that through that lens of, um, of air pollution, we know that um, not only do we have particulate matter, but a number of contaminants, chemical stressors, we call them, uh, you've heard earlier too about lead and, and mercury. 
Uh, and we know that air pollution doesn't only increase uh, pulmonary uh, in, uh, effects, but it also increases excess mortality in, the, in, cardio, in a cardiovascular way, hypertension, diabetes, and in a renal way particularly. So continuing with the research policy and practice gap through the lens of air pollution, we very clearly can say that there's a lack of air monitoring across many of our Caribbean nations. And yes, I am from the Caribbean, I'm from Suriname. Um, there is absolutely a lack of population-based studies and particularly cohort studies. Um, there is a need for studies in, in between disasters. We go through hurricanes, we go through floods, we go through droughts, but in between, that's where we need to focus on and capture the health of as a baseline level of the population. Um, I can't say enough about the need for transdisciplinary data science. And it is that precision public health because there are not all the, the, the funds in the world, but it is about tailoring to those uh, populations that are most vulnerable our research as well as our policy. When we look at air pollution through the lens of policy, um, some country-based policies exist, but no Caribbean-wide, no regional air quality standards. And it's not only about development and implementation, but that I absolutely said it's about enforcement. And lastly, on practice, um, as I mentioned before, limited translation to frontline action and a lack of a trained transdisciplinary workforce. So let me end um, with thanking my um, collaborators, Dr. Abdul Bakid, Dr. Covert, and end with my, uh, my contact information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. And thanks to everybody for keeping pretty much on time. So we've had an interesting uh, question come through in the chat, which has asked us, we're all, uh, professionals in academia and in various institutions, but uh, climate change affects everybody. And the question was, and it's open to all the panelists, how can the informal researchers who are out there, because it's affecting everybody, how can they have their voices heard uh, by us in the scientific world? So how can how can the informal researchers strengthen the research capacity? Okay, um, I think I'll, I'll go with that. So there are many um, opportunities really for the so-called informal persons to, to actually interact with the formal sector, so to speak. I think a, a lot of us who are now in, into public health and community research one of the things that a lot of us are, are recognizing is the power, the strength of what we call community-based research. And, and in those kinds of activities, what will happen is that the, the researcher would actually be engaging with the community. Um, and, and therefore, in engaging with the community, these informal researchers would then have an opportunity to um, participate um, and it, allow the bilateral flow of information and ideas. So, so I do think um, those things are, are, are possible. Um, and certainly um, there's a lot of what we call community-based, community participatory kind of research that is now being employed across the Caribbean region. You know, to add to uh, Dr. Reed's uh, comments, we need to be, we in academic institutes need to be bold enough to be able to have decisions ma making be jointly, have communities be involved from the beginning of the development of the protocol all the way to implementation and evaluation. And so just it being community-based is not enough. Um, and our community engage, it really should be a participatory from the beginning. And I can't say enough about the importance of citizen science, the importance of training communities as, as climate and health ambassadors, if you want to call it uh, like that. But without their wisdom, and, and Ariune earlier in the panel talked about it, without their wisdom, what we're doing is very theoretical otherwise. Right. No, th th thank you for those responses. And um, 
I think if we can look at the other end of the, the spectrum, perhaps for uh, Londona, how, how do you see that the uh, governments of the region can help build and strengthen research capacity in this area? Yeah, so um, as I pointed out from the UNFCCC's um, uh, perspective, the institutions need to function within the, uh, within the national uh, context, that enabling environment. And there has to be uh, some collaboration between government and um, academia. And the collaboration here should not just be, as colleagues pointed out, for the sake of um, getting information, but it has to be meaningful. Government can provide um, technical support. In some cases, they facilitate the research. Um, they, are the, uh, they are knowledgeable about the problems in the community. And that can be shared with academic institutions to facilitate the institutions to undertake those kind of work. There are other resources as well that governments can share and provide and so help and strengthen the, um, the research arms within the academic institutions. Um, policy also is very important. Government policies can help to build and or strengthen academia's role um, and that is also a very valuable um, area that government can provide support for um, that work in. So, um, Carl, can I just add as well? Absolutely. Um, one of the challenges we have with the Caribbean government is that they view research as an expense item. Um, and, and therefore, um, it is something ideally that they try and keep off their books. And so a lot of the research that is actually done in the Caribbean is being funded primarily through external agencies. And therefore, in a sense, as researchers, we, we have to tailor our agenda, not so much for the carbon specific needs, but to also suit the external agenda. So if we, if the governments of the regions can be convinced and buy into the idea that research is an investment in our own future, then I think we can start moving towards the, the natural kind of investment that we need to get this kind of um, effort um, to be successful. I agree, and I, I wonder if I could bring in Francis here to comment on the uh, the role of uh, the UK, perhaps in uh, because there's so much more money that's available in the UK to help uh, fund this type of research over here. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's partly uh, what Lancet Countdown is doing. I guess collaborating in um, with the University of West Indies to to um develop capacity and if you like share and access and funding through foundations in the caribbean but also in the other regions that we're working in so um uh we have a a, a collaborative office if you like so it's not our office it's a it's a hub um in latin america in peru that that works with um ecuador mexico brazil argentina um so across the latin american region there's a hub in uh, Beijing, um, in China, which will be an Asia hub. Uh, there's a hub in Australia. Um, and then we're working with researchers, including Rowani and, and her colleagues, um, and in Europe. So there's um, sort of hubs across each regional, sort of each part of the, each region um, of Lancet Countdown. But we're really keen to develop the capacity in low and middle income countries. Uh, because it's, it's quite clear that the, the, the funding isn't available for research in low and middle income countries, much in the same way as, as COPs in the, in the Kyoto process, the UNFCCC process, that all the resources go to the high income countries and they have delegations with, you know, sort of, well, huge delegations with, with several tens of people in the delegations, maybe even 100 if you're the, the US delegation, for example, um, but you might have one member from, say, Samoa. And, and so there's, there's just that complete um, lack of equality in terms of access and participation in the negotiations in terms of numbers of people who can be involved. And that's reflected in, in resources for research as well. Right, and, and talking of some more, Ruana, could you share with us, how is uh, research, strengthening research in the Pacific 
islands who probably share the same sort of LMIC status that we have here in many of the Caribbean islands. How, how is funding uh, for this type of strengthening of research uh, going over there in the Pacific? Um, it's quite difficult with the Pacific countries that are in the region because they've already got really um, constrained resources at the moment to deal with all these big threats. So um, collaboration, I guess, has been the key for the region. I mean, I think just tying in with some of the things um, that we've just spoken about. So one great example is the British Academy, actually. Um, we got some funding from them when travel was a thing. And we were able to bring in researchers from Oxfam Pacific um, and other um, independent researchers to have a writing workshop. And from that, we were able to get um, a peer reviewed, edited publication out with small states and territories. So that for us, in terms of leveraging funding from countries like the United States and from the UK, has enabled these kind of research capacity um, building activities, but for us, we can't just think about the tertiary sector, it goes all the way back into um, secondary schools. So how do we get better teachers? How do we um, leverage off digital um, spaces and their infrastructure to then reach those hard to reach um, communities all across the region? So for us, it's really about um, the geopolitics as well. Like we've got populations who are in atolls to then in Papua New Guinea, really isolated communities. So kind of getting that knowledge from those hard to reach um, communities is a difficult task, but it's an important one. Thank you, Rana. And maybe Maureen with the, in the country with perhaps the deepest pockets, can you share with us? What is the largest debt? <laughs> no, I, I thought you meant Suriname. The country with the deepest pockets, um, it's, it's tough um, because it, where policy and politics collided for many years. And now I think we're on a positive path uh, to begin to focus on climate. Uh, climate research was happening for a long time, but the climate and health component, and as you know, um, this conference next week, the next conference from this uh, consortium of universities of global health and the entire National Academy of Medicine is going to focus on um, climate and COVID. And so we're making progress, um, but it's still very competitive in terms of requesting funding. Um, we're hoping there is, an, there is a request for information that just came out, anticipating a request for applications on climate and health. So I'm hopeful, Cal. I know we're, we're almost ending, but there are a series of questions in, in the chat and I'd be happy to help answer those if that's appropriate. Right, I saw one, uh, thank you, Maureen, in the chat that said, how do we, because we're all uh, subject to the natural disasters and increased hurricanes and storms, how are we going to make sure that we preserve the biospecimens that, uh, we collect and, and store and, and ensure that they, they're preserved? Uh, it's a real challenge because I, I mean, of course, you know, our, our long-term uh, epidemiological cohort study in Suriname, uh, where we have over 14,000 biospecimens um, currently. And what we're doing is we actually are aliquoting and preserving some of the aliquots in the US in different areas in the country so that we don't, we're not overwhelmed by it. But even in the US, um, we lose specimens. We've lost specimens when I was in, uh, in New Orleans uh, after Hurricane Katrina, but we are aliquoting and preserving um, the specimens and putting them in multiple locations. Thank you, Maureen. Would anyone like to add to that? Um, it's a very important challenge that we're going to have. Sure, I, I don't think we, um, as Maureen intimated, the, the, the response has to be decentralized storage. That, that's, the, that's the response. Um, and so what you will have to do, different regions will have different uh, risk. Um, and so that will help guide the, the sites that are chosen for, for decentralization. Um, the other part of it is where you can archive things and in terms of convert it into data, you, you, you do that as quickly as you possibly can. But the physical specimen, um, the only solution really is decentralization. 
Right, I agree. And the challenge might be one day is <laughs> where do we decentralize these two? <laughs> um, there's always Mars. <laughs> there's always Mars, yes. We'll have to partner with some of the billionaires. Um, so there's another question about the number of physicians, public health specialists, uh, I'd include veterinarians in there, that we're, we're coming up with these new uh, policies. How do these policies get translated into, uh, into good um, action by the, by the governments? Sure, and, and the, the answer to that has to be with partnership. So partnership with professional organizations, so the Caribbean College of Family Physicians, the group of physicians across the Caribbean. So it's going to be through various networks and partnerships that you will have these kinds of translational sets of activities. So the point I was trying to make, and in, in certainly in my presentation, is that as, as academic folks go in the institutions, public health folks focus in the communities and so on, you have to involve important professional stakeholders. Um, so whether it be dentists, veterinarians, physicians, and so on. And we also have to look at a pan-Caribbean approach, not just an individual island approach, uh, because there's lots of similarities in terms of the environment um, that we practice in. I agree. I, I think just... regional approach is the best way to go so that we, you don't have individual country differences because our, the resources are very limited. But it's also critical that those policies are evidence-based, that they're data-driven and not developed at the back of an envelope uh, on a Saturday <laughs> evening in a bar, so. <laughs> or in a golf course. <laughs> and it I, might be some of the best. Sorry, I think that's uh, Francis. Yeah, I just wanted to add though, um, agree with all of that but I do think we really need to focus and and prioritize I mean the lesson we've learned from the pandemic is that we can move really swiftly when we really need to you know as a world as a globe and and the focus was we needed a vaccine we needed to understand how to manage symptoms we needed interventions and we needed behavioral change and every nation has had to work through that with with uh, guidance and input if you like from WHO you know the IPCC has indicated we've got a decade to change track so we don't have 30 or 40 years to change track. We've got 10 years to change track. And that means we do really have to start choosing the priorities and, and focusing on them globally, nationally, regionally, locally, working all in the same direction within a time frame of eight to nine years. Thanks, so that's a really important point. And I, I guess my question back to you would be, how, how do we really generate the relevant questions for the relevant policies to be developed. How, how do we as a global community make those policy decisions? Yeah, I don't think I can answer that in just like the couple of minutes that we've got here, but I actually think that is all there on the table. But work, that work has been done over the last 30 years and, and we need to, to, to put that effort in now, in this next year or so, you know, post COP26 to really hammer those answers out to those questions. I think, I think the work's been done. We've just got to, we've got to align and, and focus and uh, recognize the urgency of what we're facing. Right, yes, no, I, I think uh, we all uh, appreciate the urgent need for it. And um, I think for many, uh, it's a little overwhelming when they, they think of all the things that need to change and evolve and get done. Uh, in the little time that uh, we perhaps have left to make those significant changes. I, yeah, I, could I, I mean, could I just jump in on that though? I mean, as an sure. ecologist, that's part of my training is, um, is an ecological perspective. And, uh, you know, I, one th if you change one thing in an ecosystem and it affects everything. So I don't think the answer is to try and uh, work out how to change everything. It's to work out what one thing could really make a difference. And one of those one things could be a real focus on air pollution because if we tackle air pollution that means we're tackling fossil fuels we recognize that burning of coal oil and gas produces air pollution uh, the extraction of fossil fuels uh, harms and destroys communities and indigenous peoples um, and, and you know we have a long history of the ill health um, from mining and explosions and you know deaths in mining. so you could you could take sort of one part of the, the story 
as as uh, Maureen sort of mentioned, really, and and work through air pollution, and and that would actually deliver on so many of the things that we're talking about. I'm being signaled that um, the next session has started. Um, and so I'm being the bad person here and saying we need to end this fantastic conversation. <laughs> Maureen, thank you for, <laughs> for doing that. I'd like just to thank all the panelists for sharing their backgrounds and wish you all the very best. You're all in a pos privileged position of strengthening research capacity. So I wish you all the best in, uh, in in exciting the younger generation to come to the table and to contribute. We all have to play our part. Thank you to everyone who's uh, participated in the chat and thanks to the organizers for inviting us to contribute this panel. Thank you. You're welcome.